there any questions? Okay, thank you. Any other public comments? Good evening. My name is uh, Charles W. Schultz. And I want to start by thanking all of you for your service on this board. It's, I'm sure, not easy and a lot of time and effort and maybe not always appreciated, but I know many of us are very grateful for that. And thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm here to talk in favor of reinvestment in our community's future. Some of you may know I have the opportunity, really the privilege, for 12 years to serve in a stewardship capacity of our great city. And I would like to think that faced with a choice between spending tens of millions of dollars on outdated, outmoded, obsolete 20th century buildings, or investing in 21st century technology, safe buildings that position us for many decades to come, and that fix the problems that we have with fourth graders at Baldwin that make Quincy High School into the four-year institution that it should be, I think uh, I would hopefully make the prudent choice and support what you have in front of you tonight. This may not be the particular method I would choose, but I'm willing to support it for our kids and for our future generations. I want to talk just a minute about economic development. The best way to keep property taxes low, and we all know we live in Illinois, and it's unfortunately quite a burden. We can't do anything about that. But if we can promote investment in Quincy, we increase or equalize assessed valuation. During the 1990s, we had phenomenal growth. Six, seven, eight percent increases every year in the EAV, so we were able to significantly reduce property tax rates and still bring in as much or more revenue. The key to that, of course, is economic development, being out there selling Quincy, promoting investment. Well, I can tell you that the number one selling point needs to be quality education. So the Quincy public school system is inextricably tied to economic development and promoting growth in our community. As I was driving out tonight, I thought about my grandfather, who sat where you're sitting, although this building didn't exist 80-some years ago, but he was a member of the Quincy Public School Board. And he made some choices, along with his colleagues, to invest in the future to benefit his kids, benefit his grandkids, myself among them. And I say that as a graduate of St. Peter's Grade School and Christian Brothers High School as were my parents and my kids went to St. Peter's and QMD and I suppose there's little chance my grandchildren will ever enroll in Quincy Public Schools. But that doesn't mean they don't have a great stake in the outcome here. They have everything to lose if we don't make the right choice here because I want those kids and all of our kids to be able to grow up in a community 30, 40, 50 years from now that's a vibrant, prosperous city with all sorts of opportunities to be involved in industry or finance or the medical field, the arts, whatever that choice may be. So as a result, I'm here tonight to tell you that I'm going to be supporting this measure and to urge you and all of my fellow citizens to carefully consider this as the investment in the quality of life for Quincy that I truly believe it is. Thank you. Any other public comments? I'm Terry Carey. I really had no intentions of speaking, but I just left another community um, event that was going on, 
and the discussion was going on, and, and, and the mother of several, two children, several of them were talking, and they're saying, you know, why are you doing this all at one time? When in 25, 30 years from now, 35 years, it'll be the burden laid on their children too. And, and not spreading it out over a period of time, the same thing will develop in 35 years or how many to rebuild schools then. And so therefore, it was, it was a good discussion everyone had and a lot of people feel that way. So it'll be laid out on them later too. Thank you. Hi, George Kirkard. I'm a local orthopedic surgeon, um, Quincy High grad, 1984. That makes me 48, in case you're doing the math. Um, my wife is 50. Um, <laughs> as you might know, I was uh, on the facilities committee that looked at options for new facilities here at Quincy. We haven't had a new building in 42 years. I think we need to do something. I think there's a lot of different somethings we can do. Um, but I think this is a very nice option. We obviously aren't going to please everybody with anything that we do, um, but at some point we need to start. And kind of from the facilities committee standpoint, this is a very nice option to allow our young children to have the best opportunity to advance here in Quincy. And I think um, Mayor Schultz brought up a good point with economic development. We're losing a lot of business out of town. I don't think we need to. Um, when we recruit in, in the medical field, um, I'm always proud to tell our recruits, uh, prospective physicians, that we have a phenomenal public school and a phenomenal parochial school that gives people the opportunity to choose. Choice is always very well received by people. Um, some physicians send their uh, kids to parochial schools, some come in, send them to, the, to uh, public schools. So I think we really need to have a strong public school system, and this is uh, definitely something that will lead us into the future. In that vein, I guess, uh, I have volunteered to lead up a committee of citizens to support uh, any further action that needs to be done uh, here in Quincy uh, if a referendum is proposed uh, to proceed with support in that manner uh, and do anything I can to help our kids knowing full well that my youngest kid is 12 and he will not see benefits of that. Um, but that doesn't mean when I'm an old bugger, retired, that uh, I'm still willing to live in a town with schools that will be 100 plus years old. So I think it's a very nice option. I'm willing to help in any way possible. And uh, we are ready to launch um, if you guys give the approval tonight. Thank you. Thank you, George. <clears throat> Anyone else? Okay, hearing them, we'll move on to item four, which is to consider and approve the resolution for providing, providing for and requiring the submission of the proposition of issuing school building bonds to the voters of the district at the general election to be held on the fourth day of November 2014. Board members, I have an official, uh, I have an official recommendation for you. Two summers ago, the QPS School Board directed my administration to re review the current facilities, facility situation, and develop a plan to address our aging buildings. I appointed Joel Murphy, our business manager, to lead and conduct a facility study for the board to consider options in the fall of 2013. The board reviewed the information and directed me to form a district steering committee consisting of committee members, educators, and business leaders, etc., to gather additional information along with hiring an architectural firm to develop in conjunction with the steering committee an architectural master plan. The steering committee has met since February of 2014 and has presented me with a recommendation to the board. This now brings us to August 14th, 2014 with an official recommendation. And what I'm going to read as the official recommendation is also what you will see on your ballot. And that's why it sounds like a wheeze. I recommend to the Board of Education of Quincy School District Number 172, Adams County, Illinois, acquire land, improve the sites of, and build and equip three new elementary school buildings, demolish the Monroe Elementary School building, improve the site thereof, and build and equip a new elementary school building thereon. Improve the site of, build and equip additions, and to and alter, repair, renovate, and equip 
the Baldwin Intermediate School Building and build and equip the new elementary school building at said site. Improve the site of, build and equip additions to, and alter, repair, renovate, and equip the Quincy Senior High School building. Alter, repair, equip, and provide technology improvements to existing school buildings of said school district, and issue bonds of said school district to the amount of 89 million for the purpose of paying the cost thereof. Now what I'd like to do at this time is that's the official recommendation, I'd like to invite our architectural firms and I know they have a presentation and they'll be uh, willing to answer any questions from the board. And if you don't know him, it's Todd Moore. <laughs> All right, thank you. I guess I'm mic'd up here. Okay. First of all, I want to say thank you on behalf of each of the architectural firms. We truly appreciate the opportunity uh, to be here and present our plan. We feel it's a very good plan. And uh, we know you have a choice when it comes to professional services and architects. We truly appreciate this. On February 19th, the very end school, after you made the decision and voted to approve this uh, district-wide facility plan, um, I made a comment to one of our team members, so which I'm going to introduce here again in just a minute. Uh, I said, well, here we go. And, well, now here we are uh, with, a, with a plan. Um, I want to recognize uh, at this time the team. Uh, with Klingler and Associates, Steve Wavering and Mike Carter. Pepping Stone Bach is uh, Steve, Wa uh, Steve Freiberg and Dave Schlumbach. Uh, Darren Prost and Mark Meyer with Architects. You know, I've said this before, but we could not have provided a plan like this without utilizing the strengths of each of the firms. And I might have to ask you to turn that back on for one second because I can't see. <laughs> It's hard enough with the lights on for me to see at my age. So um, we try to play out the strengths of one another, and as a team, it could not have gelled better. We compete every day against each other, but uh, uh, for this project, we really came together. It was it was truly a, a joy to uh, to be a part of this. I want to give a brief history. I know you've heard this history before, but I want to give a brief history of, history of just how we got here. Um, we we want everyone to know that it wasn't just architects and engineers on their own dreaming up a plan, um, a set of floor plans and so forth to present tonight. Um, it was truly a process that took five and a half months and we feel that we vetted uh, about every option there is out there. Uh, uh, Steve uh, mentioned the steering committee. What a great cross-section of community, parents, um, staff that we had to give us direction. They were charged with a lot, and they really came through providing us direction. The information we gave uh, to the steering committee along the way was a lot of information related to our existing facilities. The size of the facilities, the size of the classrooms, the number of students, the size of the sites, uh, issues with the buildings, uh, ADA issues, um, health life safety issues uh, that we've experienced over the last 20 years and what we can expect going forward for the next 20 years. Uh, how we handle transportation with bus and parent drop-off. Um, and just the functionality of the building. Uh, some schools, when you walk in, they're, um, uh, you know, you either go up the steps or you go down the steps. So there's barriers there in our schools. We have to go down two flights of steps just to get to the restrooms in a couple of our facilities. Uh, and also, as you know, the survey that was developed by the steering committee uh, and sent out to the community received 1,700 uh, responses, and that helped give the steering committee direction and how to help them make decisions um, as to how uh, this would, would, would form. Uh, I want to just mention real quickly, um, all the different groups that we as a design team met with along the way, there's 17 different area level planning committees. Uh, we met with the K-2 teachers, 3, 5, 6, 8, 9, 12, music, library, kitchen, PE, uh, the QHS science uh, department, VOTEC, security, transportation, maintenance and custodial, alternative school, technology, uh, special education and administration. So we, we, we met with the, the people that actually are in these buildings every day teaching our children. And in these, meet, in these meetings, we ask these teachers to tell us what's good, what's bad. We ask them to think outside the box uh, of what would be, what would be uh, 
beneficial to help you teach. And so um, from, from those meetings, we developed a program. It's an architectural program. It's a recipe for how a building might go together if we could have everything we need to uh, provide uh, the curriculum to teach our children the best. We also then presented standards to the steering committee on what's being done nationally, what's being done at the, at the state level. Um, what are the size of the buildings? How are the grades configured across the country? And um, we talked about um, what are the size of the classrooms uh, and what's being done on the, on the national and the state level. We then developed a greenfield. We call it greenfield. It purely just means it's what, it, what would a building be like in a green space, for example, out behind the road school, a nice big green field. Um, and so with the program, um, uh, we developed the Greenfield Standard School. We then showed graphically, graphically to the steering committee how these Greenfield schools would maybe fit on our existing sites. Would they fit on an Adams School site or a Washington School or a Madison School? If we renovated or added additions to these schools, how would, how would we do that to meet these standards? We asked for limiting factors. Um, uh, to give us direction. For example, what did the steering committee at that point in time, what did they want us to uh, for sure consider to move forward? Well, one thing, or several things, uh, they wanted ninth grade to move to uh, Quincy High School, to this building, to be part of uh, the high school experience. They wanted to keep junior high school. They wanted 900 square foot classrooms, and they wanted to limit the classroom sizes to 25 students. The steering committee evaluated the grade configurations. Uh, K, K8 was evaluated, K5, K6, K2, or keep the K3, 4, 6, 7, 9, 10, 12 arrangement. Those things were all discussed and vetted thoroughly. We focused on how we could utilize our existing buildings. There's a lot of uh, people that like our old buildings. Uh, their children went through it, maybe they went through it. Um, and how could we maybe expand a Madison school or expand a, a Monroe school or a Washington school? But the difficulties were, is we're limited. We're limited by the infrastructure of the building. We're limited by the classroom sizes, which are, in some cases, a lot less than 900 square feet. We're limited by the site, how the parents drop off and not mix with the bus drop off. There were all sorts of restrictions um, that uh, played into this that, that we, the steering committee then eliminated sites from, from the process. We then looked at um, uh, how do we evaluate going forward. We got all these different variables and all these different directions we can go. And we've got all this information, so we said, okay, let's look at this from an economic standpoint as well. And so we did the life cycle cost analysis, and we came up with a lot of different options. What happens if we have a three-section, four-section, five-section combination between Adams and Madison, and maybe a new school, or we're going to add on to Baldwin School, or we're going to have a senior high one and a senior high two again with nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. We, added, we, we looked at all these different things and we put a cost to each of these. What does it cost up front? What does it cost to, uh, to continue to spend health life safety dollars in these existing buildings if we keep them and add on to them or renovate them? Uh, what are the operational savings from a uh, labor and maintenance and custodial and uh, energy standpoint? So at the end of the day, you have a 20 year life cycle cost. And the steering committee, you, 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 the steering committee made very good decision in the fact that if we eliminate our old inefficient buildings, we can eliminate a lot of headaches from health life safety costs to operational costs and energy costs and build four new, and this is back at the end of phase one in June, let's build four new 850 student schools, K-5, and put them all on new sites with the, with the idea of using Monroe as a site. The key was, for the steering committee also, was the fact that every K-5 student, child, would experience a new building. We weren't going to come back to a renovated building, it was going to be a new building. And so, we had a recommendation back in June. Uh, you as a board approved us as a design team to move into phase two. And we started then to take that option and put it on the paper from this recipe or architectural program uh, to develop a, a plan of how this building or buildings would look. The architects each worked independently, coming up with 10 to 15 different options of what a building would look like. But what we kept coming back to over the summer, over the last month, month and a half, was we couldn't get the gross score footage down to even within a budget that we could do, uh, that we could bond. And so a new idea emerged 
a few weeks ago, and that was to reuse the common space, the large space of Baldwin School, the gym, the cafeteria, and the auditorium, and then build on classrooms to that. But by doing that, we'd go to five schools instead of four, five K-5s, four sections, 650 student buildings. And that made a lot of sense because we were reducing the size of each of these buildings, which was more in line with what the public wanted uh, in the surveys. So last week, we even had two plans of what that K-5 might look like. And uh, they were kind of, they were contrasting plans. Um, and uh, today we have one plan to show you uh, of what, uh, what this K-5 could look like on a greenfield space. There'd be four of those, obviously utilizing Monroe as one of the sites, so three new sites. And then how we would add on to Baldwin School to make it a K-5, and then how we would accommodate ninth grade out here at high school. So let's get into the slideshow, and I'm gonna walk over here. Hopefully you can still hear me. And I don't get feedback off this big speaker over here. Okay, can everybody hear me? Okay, this first sheet is just some facts about the K-5 elementary schools. Uh, 24 900 square foot classrooms, each are a four section school. We have the special education instructional space, uh, which would consist of cross-cat, sensory, and ED rooms, uh, spaces for speech, interventionalists, teacher work rooms, a multi-purpose musical space um, with instructor work room. Uh, we have storage for instruments and sheet music and so forth. And then we have a space that can be opened up from the music to the cafeteria uh, for an event. So you could have some, you could have uh, families coming in to watch a musical uh, program. A 5,000 square foot gymnasium for PE, so that every child every day can experience PE in that gym. And uh, this gym could be uh, constructed as a tornado safe room if the governor does sign that into legislation um, uh, in the upcoming months. Uh, cafeteria kitchen assembly area of 3,900 square feet, uh, seating half of the students uh, at one time, but the idea is to pass the students through the cafeteria in an hour and a half or three periods. The administration area uh, will consist of a checkpoint and then all the spaces that would be obviously in the administrative areas for uh, offices, conference room, nurse, and so forth. And then the teaming activity rooms. These are spaces outside the classrooms uh, where the, uh, the teachers can take their students, maybe from a couple different classes, come out into this common space, which you're gonna see here in just a few minutes on the plan, and they can have an, they can have an art exhibit, they can have a, a science exhibit. So these are gathering spaces or teaming rooms um, that we're calling them. Okay, let's look at the floor plan, and this is it. Um, this plan is, uh, is symmetrical, as you can see, with the, uh, the classrooms on each end. Um, We've got uh, K through two on this end, th uh, three through five on this end. You can see there's four classrooms uh, in each of these areas, kindergarten, first, second. You can see the, there's a little breakout area. And I, I wanna mention uh, something that, uh, the way it was described last week by Mike Carter of Klinger Associates, I think he, I think he nailed it. Um, if you look at the classroom, maybe look at that as a family. So you've got these families they could break out into this area, maybe for a one-on-one -on -one or a, some, some private instruction with a teacher and a student. That's the neighborhood. We've got a neighborhood now. And if you look at this cluster with this common teaming area in the middle, we've got a community. So we've got a family, a neighborhood, and a community. What a better way, there's, I can't think of a better way to describe what we're trying to do here. So um, on the other end, we've got similar, similar arrangement. But then, in, like for example, the first grade wing, we've got, a, we've got a reading recovery room. We've got toilet rooms in each of the different neighborhoods. You can see the, you can see the restroom areas. We've got uh, cross-cat rooms. We've got uh, ED rooms with calming areas. We've got speech rooms. We've got um, uh, teacher resource rooms, um, sensory areas accounted for. And similarly on the other side. So it's, it's, it's really a, a very symmetrical plan with the idea we've got reading uh, interventionalists. We've even got little spaces for one-on-one -on -one intervention even in each, one of these, in each one of these areas. If you look at the common space in the middle, you see the music area that can, has, a, has an opening that can be opened up, as I mentioned earlier, to have an event, a musical performance that seats uh, people. Otherwise, it's a cafeteria. 
We've got kitchen space and the utilitarian spaces that go around that. And then down in here, the administrative area, main entrance. And I want to talk about security. Unfortunately, we have to talk about security in, uh, in today's world, unfortunately, but it's a reality. And this plan uh, does a very good job with a four level security system or, or uh, process. Visitors entering the building come through the outside doors and they're in, a, they're in a, an area where they can't get past this set of doors until they're checked through by a security guard. If allowed in, they can come into this waiting room. Maybe they need to see somebody in administration. Maybe there's a meeting here in the conference room. Otherwise, they're allowed to come out of the waiting area into the hallways um, and maybe make their way then down to a classroom. That's the first level. Each community on each side, there's a set of doors that can be locked down to lock down the communities. As you get into the neighborhoods where the classrooms are, there's another set of doors. Those could be locked if necessary as a third level, and the fourth level being the classroom, the classroom doors being locked. So it's a very secure way, a good way to protect our kids in the unfortunate event that something could happen. So in, in the unfortunate event that somebody could make their way down into the area, into the neighborhood, outside the classrooms, there in this particular, we're showing an example here, you can see the classroom doors, and I'm not sure you can see that all in the back, but we have, we have, we have doors actually between the classrooms that the kids are not confined in a room, but they can move from room to room if that were the case. So security uh, played a uh, very important uh, aspect of how these buildings were, were laid out. Okay, let's see what the site plan uh, looks like. Okay, this, this represents a two city block area. So you can see the building is 66,000 square feet. You can see how we're gonna handle now transportation. Bus, buses come in, um, drop off, kids come through the front. Um, we've separated that from the parent drop off, which is a huge issue here in Quincy. If you've ever been down Main Street at Madison in the morning, you can see the confusion and the, and, uh, uh, the mess that that is. But, but in this case, we've got, if your student or your child is in the K, K2 grade level, your parent can come in, drop off, and they come directly into their community. Likewise, on the other end for grades three through five. Staff parking on this end. Staff would then could enter the building here with uh, a security measure of a key fob, uh, whatever it might be. And then we've got playground areas, basketball court and some playground area out here. This is just a graphical representation of what it could be. It's not, this is set in stone, but this is just trying to show a representation of what the site uh, uh, could look like if it were a two city block area. Now. The other consideration is this is a flat site. If we were in a situation where we purchased a piece of property that was sloping, the way of being symmetrical, this wing here could sit on top of this wing here for a two-story classroom wing, and the common spaces then would be on a single level. I also might want to add that if our population grows, these buildings can be added onto in the classroom areas very easily. So we're not going to shoehorn ourselves into a site where we can't add on or down the road if the school district decides to go to a K-6 uh, configuration, this, could be a com this, this would accommodate that, therefore junior high being a seventh and eighth grade uh, facility. Okay, let's go to the next slide, which is a bird's eye view of this school. You see the bus drop off out front, and we've got uh, each of the wings on, on both ends. Now, what you see here, and you'll see in the next couple slides, notice the large popped up areas. These are clear story areas that, that uh, rise above the normal ceiling heights and we, we allow light to come in for natural daylighting to get into these spaces. Studies prove that natural daylight uh, coming into the building uh, improves a student's ability to learn. And so skylights over the different neighborhood areas. You can see the uh, cafeteria with a large uh, kind of a grand space where we have nice natural light coming in through the high uh, clear story areas. Main entrance um, in the front. Okay, next slide. Please. Okay, here's a view from the front. You can see the main entrance here. You see these areas that are popped up, letting a lot of natural daylight in. Let's go to the next. Just another front view of this. You'll see the word Greenfield. That's not going to be the name of the school, but that's what we've been using throughout the process. Okay, here's the front entrance. 
Now, um, one of the questions that, have, that, that was posed to us um, in a meeting yesterday was, are all these schools going to look the same? Well, from a floor plan standpoint, they function very well, so they're going to be very similar. Very similar from a floor plan, but what can happen is there can be different types of materials or brick colors used. Uh, you can see we're using a lot of masonry here. Long lasting, it's Quincy architecture, we've got some banding going on, but maybe the front entrance could be changed uh, for each of the schools to give it its own identity. Maybe, depending on where the schools are at, they might take on some architecture of that neighborhood where it's located. So we have a lot of options. Uh, this is just one option. Not necessarily this is going to be the brick color or, and, and so forth, but this is just an option. Okay. All right, moving on to Baldwin. <clears throat> just to get your bearings, uh, 30th Street out here, Main Street is up here, Circle Drive, you get the round room. I don't know if anybody's partial to the round room, but it's going to go. Uh, <laughs> And you can see that um, uh, the, the lighter shaded area is the demolition of Baldwin School, this being the mall area. Um, you'll see here in a second, this is going to be the location for the new building. But the darker shaded area is what's going to stay. The gymnasium, obviously the corridor system, the cafeteria and kitchen, and the auditorium with the music space around this. Now, obviously, this is different than the other schools because we have a large auditorium. Um, but that's where the efficiency came in when we made the decision to go to five schools from four is we're reutilizing this space. Even though this space was always going to stay, uh, we thought if we're going to keep it, let's use it. And that's exactly what we're doing. Okay. This is how the plan fits now on this site. Auditorium, kitchen cafeteria, gymnasium. And we are connecting here. Here's where the round room used to be. But on this plan, <clears throat> how we're separating the parent and bus uh, traffic is parents will enter in off of uh, 30th Street, come up here, drop their child off, continue on out the Circle Drive out of the Main Street. Bus traffic then will continue to be on this side of the building with the students entering here uh, at this location, this existing location. What you'll notice about this plan, though, is it's, it's the other plan cutting out the center section of the common spaces and bringing it together fitting it nicely for just a classroom wing. This being the administration and security point uh, for entry. And the difference uh, between, the lab, between the other plan and this is the common area is, is blended together. And uh, this will work very well. You can, and we did on the other plan, you, there's two different arrangements. You have a lot of seating here and you got some tables set up here. Just an idea of what can be done in those, on those large spaces. There may not be anything in here because we might be having a, a science exhibit, possibly. Am I standing in your way? Can you see? Okay. All right. Um, now, let's see what this looks like uh, from a perspective. Uh, this is the plan view. Okay. Um, this is how the plan fits in the mall area. You can see the existing building. Circle Drive, then, here's our connects. It just goes, keeps right on going around the crest of the hill and connects back in down here uh, in this parking area. This is 50,000 square feet, if you're wondering. The other buildings were 66 but we're obviously utilizing the square footage in here, and that's the, that's the difference. Okay, a bird's eye perspective. Looking down, we've got the, uh, uh, the, aud the auditorium. Lost it there for a second. Auditorium, gymnasium, here's the connection here. Here's the circle drive coming up. We come up, we drop off, and continue on. And here's the clear story pop-up in that common area, letting natural light in along with skylights over the neighborhood areas. Here's a perspective. This is almost as if you were standing at 30th and Main looking up the hill. The only thing is you've been elevated up to the same elevation because in, in reality you'd be, you'd be looking up at this. But this is what you would see from the corner of 30th and Main. Here's the main entrance. Here's that drive coming around the crest uh, of, the, uh, of the hill there. And this being the new building, fitting in real nicely, it'll be a, a very nice view from 30th and Main of what you would see in this new school. All right. Yep. Okay, moving on to Quincy High School, where we're at right now. Um, 27 new classrooms. 24 of these new classrooms are 900 square foot or larger. Uh, there's a minimum of 20 classrooms that are needed to accommodate the freshmen. 18 of these are now lo will be located in the new freshman area. Uh, the new freshman area will be constructed then also as a 
tornado safe area. Because in the other buildings we were using the gymnasium, we can't go to this gym and, and reconstruct it to withstand a 350 mile per hour tornado. So this new addition that you're going to see here in a couple slides is where that tornado safe room would be if that's the way uh, it is determined we go. There are seven new classrooms uh, that will be located in a two-story addition on building E, which is that building straight across there, which houses our science area. Uh, special education instructional space, three 300 square foot uh, special learning classrooms that will be in the new area, uh, ninth grade area. Um, and then an existing nurse's office and building E being converted to a teacher's workroom. Um, nothing really happening in building A, which is the music uh, auditorium space. Uh, for the, for, to accommodate the additional physical education, um, we're going to put a one-story, 5,000-square-foot addition to the south side of Building C, which is the gym building. It'll house two new fitness rooms, uh, two new uh, locker rooms, and then there's an existing fitness room in Building C that'll be con converted into a health classroom. Okay, next slide. Okay, the cafeteria where we are at right now. Uh, the cafeteria will be expanded by 2,500 square feet, which will go right up through this wall right over here. That's the expansion area we're heading to. You'll see that in just a minute also. Uh, the existing kitchen here behind me is being expanded by 1,435 square feet in storage as well. Uh, in the administrative area, uh, new, new security checkpoints, uh, the security out front now will still be there except we're going to reconstruct it on the outside of the building. It's attached to the building but it's on the outside. Uh, so we're, we're, we're getting, we're, we're uh, securing the building by um, sc uh, sc screening people prior to getting into the main part of the building. Um, there'll be a new west entrance uh, where stu uh, students will come through as well, which you'll see in a minute. There'll be also a um, security checkpoint. And then the, the main office administrative area out here that you walked by will be reconfigured um, accordingly to accommodate uh, new office spaces uh, for various parts of the administration. And then the new, uh, the new freshman wing will also have a, a 1,900 uh, square foot technology lab. So what does this look like in aerial view? Uh, parking lot um, out front. So if you drive to school, you will still, the students will still enter through this new security checkpoint here into the building. Um, you can see that we're adding a new drive now to the west side of us over here. You'll, you'll, you'll come down across here, you'll come up the hill, you'll make the turn if you're on the bus, which most, most ninth graders will probably be on, be on the bus because they're not driving yet, but they'll be entering the new freshman wing here that is, will now fit between where we're at now and the music building. So this courtyard out here to the north is where we're going to have a single story freshman uh, area to accommodate the freshman core classes. Here is the uh, uh, building C uh, fitness single story. It's going to house the new fitness rooms and lockers. Um, and then here's the two story addition on building E, which will be uh, additional classrooms and science labs. So, what does that look like in floor plan? Um, here we are, right here in the cafeteria. So, you can see how this whole space is infilled with classrooms and technology. Uh, additional space here that I mentioned just here to the north of us for seating capacity and then additional kitchen and kitchen storage and then we have the special learning uh, rooms here. Um, the yellow areas are renovated areas. That's what I just talked about, the administrative areas. Um, so right now there's, there's four corridors. If you notice when you walk out, there's a corridor that you probably walk down to get here. There's one on the other side of the main offices and there's also some out here with lockers in here. Well that's all coming out and it's going to be infilled with, um, with rooms for administrative purposes. Two corridors is all we really need to get through here in this, in this case. People ask the question, what are you doing with the lockers? Where are the lockers going to go? Well, the reality of it is about 60% of the kids in high school don't use their lockers anymore. So um, that's still being talked about. It's still going to be a discussion going forward as to um, uh, what we really do. But we have space out here in the common areas to uh, accommodate lockers, as well as we're keeping the lockers up here in, in the, where the band area is and also down here in the gymnasium building. Here's the classroom addition to building E. You can see that there's four new uh, classrooms here. And here's the fitness added on to the gym building and then the security checkpoint out front. So we have security here where the kids that have come off the bus, they're dropped off, they come right into their, into their wing. We also have security, new security out front. 
The next slide is just uh, the second floor plan, which is rather uneventful because we have a lot of just new roofs as they're single story. But over here, we have new science labs, since this is the science department right here. So we're accommodating for additional science laboratories on the second floor of that building. Okay, this is a bird's eye perspective. Uh, if you were hovering out above the parking lot in the front, um, this is the new security entrance, gymnasium uh, fitness addition, the two-story uh, addition to the science building. And here's the infill for all the classrooms to accommodate the additional students here at Quincy High School. We are showing a new canopy. If you, if you notice now, it's just wide open. So if you're standing underneath the canopy, you're gonna get wet. After this, you're gonna be dry. So, and then you can also see the new drive coming up around, um, around here. And you're also noticing it's cutting through our baseball field down there, but that'll just be relocated somewhere in this area um, at that time. Okay, this is just a different perspective, uh, looking at the front again. Um, nothing much new, just a different, just a different, little different angle. This is if you were looking, if you're standing out in the baseball field looking to the west, here's the two-story addition. Here's the fitness center on the, on the uh, south side of the gymnasium building. And you'll notice we're matching the brick and the style with the windows that's already here. We're not going to depart from that and do something different. We, it needs to just blend right in with the way the high school looks right now. This is looking at the west entrance of the new freshman area. So if you're kind of standing on the athletic field, I guess, uh, to the west, you'd be looking up at this. Here's the drive coming around for the, uh, for the bus drop-off, and this being the, uh, the new security entrance for, uh, for, the, for this entrance. Now, if this becomes a tornado safe area, these windows will not be here because that's something we cannot incorporate if it is a, considered a tornado safe room. Okay, next slide. Okay, this is the last slide, and, and so 89 million, what is that, how does that break down? Well, for the new building out of Monroe School, 66,000 square foot Monroe School building, sitting out behind where Monroe is now, is 14.2 million. The, the ninth grade, um, what I just talked about here at Quincy High School, all these improvements at Quincy High School is a $16 million cost. Uh, the, then we have three buildings that are identical because these are the three building, the three new K-5s that are gonna go on new property, the uh, new sites, those are all each at 15.6 million, and the, uh, the work down at Baldwin School is 12 million for a total of 89 million all in with uh, everything to have fully functional buildings, state-of-the-art technology, all the furnishings and equipment, the playground equipment, all the things that, that will make these buildings um, useful to our students. Okay, now. Question time. Any questions? Uh, I, I would just like to mention uh, that uh, for the audience that uh, the board members were briefed on this uh, over a week ago, and we asked a lot of questions there, so this is not our first presentation, and uh, uh, a lot of our qu questions were answered there, so. Does anyone have any yeah. comments? Yes. Uh, I didn't hear you mention anything about architectural phase out of this $89 million. Mm -hmm. How much is the uh, architectural phase? I know you already got about $350,000. Right. Uh, the fees are built in to this number, but um, typically it's around 7% of, of construction cost, and that's typically what architectural fees, uh, that's, a, that's a good number to use, and that's what we've used here. So 11%, what does that boil down to it's money wise? About 7%. 7 okay. Yeah. Um, off the top of my head, I don't know that number, but uh, because the, it's not 7% of 89 million, obviously. It's 7% of the construction costs. Um, it's not uh, on top of furnishings and things like that. It's, on, it's just the hard building construction costs. And I don't know that number off the top of my head, but it's 7% of construction. 
plus it's going to be uh, about $50 million just for the interest on this $89 million. Well, I don't well, know. Well, it would be pretty expensive. And it's no wonder that people are moving out of this area. Taxes are too high. You know, I've had the same people, not the same people, but uh, the same uh, question asked me, why don't they build one school at a time? Why do they want to build so many and tear so many down at once? Don't make sense. Well, but, um, and I'm speaking for the steering committee that went through all this, this entire process. As I mentioned earlier, um, there are advantages to building new and building new, and, and please note, we didn't talk about the construction schedule, but these aren't going to all be built at one time. There's going to be staggering of how we build them. But it becomes very difficult because we're changing the grade configuration from what we have now to a K-5 arrangement. And if you, if you look at other options, you can get into where kids might move um, from where they're at to uh, one building and move back to another building. The, the most efficient way to do this is with new buildings. And every, every child is going to have the same experience. And that's what it came down to, the same, the same experience in the K-5 level. So, we've thoroughly evaluated the adding on to an Adam School, or renovating an Adam School, Madison School, but there's some costs going forward because of the age of the buildings. These buildings range from 42 to 124 years old. Now, you can say, well, junior highs lasted for 80 plus years, but junior high was constructed completely differently. And it might be here for another 80 to 100 years, maybe more, I don't know. So, um, to answer your question, to build one building at a time, where do you build the building at? What student gets to have the benefit of a new building and, and a new environment? And, you know, people say, well, um, I went to school there and I did just fine. And I can say that. I went through, I went through the schools and I did just fine. But the way the world is changing and the way technology and the way we teach our kids is changing. And so, um, we, want to, we want to provide our kids the best environment to learn. We have fantastic teachers, and I'm not telling anybody that. I mean, we all know that. But they teach in, they teach in conditions that could be a lot better that would then give the student a much better learning experience. Do you know what the student population will be five years from now? I, I don't. No, they know what it does. Well, okay. The teachers have this money. And we don't know how many students we're going to be dealing with. Right. Okay, Beth, but can I ask you one question? If you have, we have two options here, basically on the table. Either we build new at $89 million plus interest, okay? Or are you going to vote for the $67 million in life safety costs to maintain our buildings plus interest? Are you going to vote to spend that I money? I hearing this all the time. And a lot of this here, life safety code, is just cosmetic. It ain't putting new roofs on. Yes, it is. Oh, no, no, it ain't. You don't go through the schools like I do. I do too, no. but I do. Okay, oh, so. Well, you got to work on the time. Todd, I mean, or Joel, can you, I mean, not to, but can you kind of list what life safety projects are coming up over the next 20 years? We've got a list, Stephanie, that we, we went through every building. And we identified what we've done over the last 20 years, which is about $53.5 million. Now, uh, to answer Bud's question, that it's a state law that you follow the health, life, safety guidelines and keep our buildings up to code. But having said that, going forward, we went through each school and looked at the major component items, the, the big ticket items. We didn't even look at the small ticket things, but we identified, um, for example, Dewey School, um, right now, the surf, the, the the skin on Dewey School, the brick is and the mortar is is deteriorating. Deteriorating. That's going to have to be addressed. So, if we're going to keep Dewey School, we got a huge expense coming down down the line with with Dewey. Um, we've got um, we got roofing issues. We've got we've. I don't have the list here, but we have a we came, that number that we came up with was not just pulled out of the out of the air. You got, I mean, Bud, you have this. It has all the projected enrollments yeah. for, for the past 20 years but and for the next 50. But, but you asked what the projected road enrollments are. It's in here. Read it. 
you know, it, also, it also has a building inventory with, with exactly what the building has, what the needs are, what the projected needs are. It's all spelled out right in here. And what these guys did is take this and put a price to it. Well, I wish you'd come down to my place. I've got all my records for 25 I've years. I've been there. <laughs> Yeah. So back then, and, you look at, you'll find and summarizing and, and moving on, so either way, you're not going to vote for a new school, you're not going to vote for us to, to improve what we have to do to maintain we the building. We already know it's called money. Uh, it's levied, yeah. we have a small levy, but not enough to cover 67 oh, million. It might be, if you get different bids from different people. Okay, moving on. Any other questions? Any questions from Comments. the public? Yeah. 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 Yes. I'm sorry to hear the question. Where is the money coming from? The money is coming from uh, the what's on the table here tonight is for the board to approve a resolution to place on the ballot a, a referendum question to uh, authorize the board to sell $89 million worth of bonds. Those bonds then will be paid off over basically a 20 year period um, based upon taxes um, that the uh, that, that would be levied to pay those bonds. Um, the district is in a unique opportunity in that regard in that we have several of, of our outstanding bond issues coming due here shortly, um, actually being paid off and uh, working with actually two different financial advisors, um, they have, have developed a, a, a program where we can do the $89 million and maintain our current overall tax rate. So we would not be increasing the tax rate um, in the community by doing this. Now, you know, will your, your taxes on your house go up? I, I, that I can't answer because I don't know what your EAV is and, and what the value of your house if it goes up or down. Um, but as, as far as the tax rate overall in the community would be, we would have a, a, a level tax rate, um, even, even selling this, this, this amount of bonds. But it, it's very simple. When you, you, you bought your house, I'm sure you didn't pay cash for it. I mean, I could be wrong. But um, you, you, they, basically, that's what we're doing. We're, we're going out and, and getting a mortgage, a uh, 20-year mortgage, to, to build these facilities. And over those 20 years, um, we will be, be paying back the principal and interest on that mortgage. Um, it's just a, it's a little bit different as, as far as how they're sold and, and, and uh, how they're paid off. But um, for a simple comparison, it's a mortgage to, to build these buildings. Yes. Any classrooms if necessary. You know, I can't hear. I like when come to the podium. My question was, uh, did the plan design allow for the expansion of additional classrooms if the community needs additional uh, student space, and how will that will that go out, or will that go up, or a combination thereof? In, in this plan, uh, Tom, it can go up, <coughs> so each of the wings could be expanded. Yes. And that's why I meant we, we don't want to shoehorn ourselves even into a site that's borderline too small because what if we need to expand? Jeff? Yes. Uh, when we had your last refunding, there was an item on there, some last page or back, about a 1% additional from Adams County. I'm sensitive. I'm sorry. On the last page of your packet, just from, uh, from our, from our there was a mention we had your 6.2 million uh, uh, for the working cash bond. There was a one percent additional from Adams County. I assume that's a collection cost. Will there will there be a collection cost uh, on these bonds as well? And also, I have a question. Uh, and I've been bringing it up for quite some time. Is the treasurer here tonight to give his opinion? on the alternatives that are out there. Is, is he going to be able to give his opinion tonight? No, I mean, Jeff, I told you before that okay. Ta Tom, or Mr. Huh? Yeah. Tim Moore. Tim Moore. I'm mixed up with Todd. Tim Moore does the paper for the treasurer's report for the board. He is, has no other input, input regarding 
the finances. But last year you voted to give... We did not vote to give him more input into this board. Well, look at what you voted on a year ago. That's all. And with, I don't have those records in front of me, but I was concerned. I brought it up a year ago at Ellington. I don't know if it's in the, I don't know if it's in the minutes, but look at what if, was done. You know, to, policy. to your question, and I'm going to just take a stab at this. Joe, you probably, Joel, you've been through this before. My sense is if the vote is positive and we go into the bond market, those kinds of things will be negotiated with the bond houses. But the 1% fee don't the one for Adams County for collection. The 1% fee is what Adams County tax on to assure the bond holders that um, they get their money. So if, per se, a, a large uh, taxpayer defaulted and did not pay their taxes, uh, Adams County would have enough in reserve to make the, those bond payments. So that's what the point of that is. Okay. And, and is that included that, in the calculations that we've had? I believe both the uh, financial advisory firms have, have calculated that in there or understand that, that, that that's what Adams County does. Okay. Um, well, on page two of your packet, I mean, did the use my data too? Is that included? Is that one? Is that included in there? Jeff, I'd have to go back to look at all the things that I've did over the last month and a half to, to figure out what exactly was, was done. But that is something that Adams County does. That is not something we do. Um, that's what, what they do. But also on top of that, the extra dollars that are collected, as long as we're collecting the proper amount, would then, at, at a future date, be able to be abated to taxes back to the, uh, to the community because we have to use them to, to pay back um, even though they're collected. So. So if there's an, you're saying if there's an over collection, if you did need that, that would come back. Yes. Yep. All right, and it's one other question. I want to make sure, even correct, I just want to make sure it's on the record, that the $6.2 million work cash bond, the first payment in principle we do be made this February 1st. Jeff, all of that has been laid out. It has okay, laid out on the record. I'm just, let me, you know, okay. you had an opportunity, I have an opportunity to respond okay. to you. Okay. When the working cash bonds fund, excuse me, when the working cash fund bonds, when the, the payment schedule was laid out, this was all laid out with that. Right. And so that the, the payment to maintain the, the level debt, and it's what, um, and unfortunately I was not here, so I'm just going by what I've read and, and stuff like that, was designed to be to maintain a level tax rate. Right. We're also proposing to do the same thing with the with these new bonds, and so they're laid out as such to. Then I think they're up in, in uh, like five years here, those working cash bonds will be paid off. That's all been laid out. That's how it's been established. Well, a lot of people in the public are not aware of that. They think some of the deals a number of years ago, they feel we've already, in their mind, they think we're already making payments on it. It's not well known out in the public. Well, okay, Jeff, uh, yeah, on a, on a 30 year mortgage, <coughs> when do you start paying more principal than interest? Well, <laughs> it takes a while. Okay, yeah. so we, we, we've done the same thing here right. in our bond structure, and now we're getting to the point where we're going to be able to start paying the, the, the principal off. It's really no different um, than, than you do with a, with a, with a home mortgage to, to make, to make the, the money that you can afford to pay um, you know, fit, the, fit your, 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 your payments. So. That's why I liked uh, Member McNay's idea as a way to avoid all that interest, the bud rate. All right, thank you. Mark? Yes. But I agree with you. I don't think uh, we're going to see the public go for this $89 million just no way. You're asking them to swallow a big pill and it's not going to happen. I do see and I agree that we do need to do something but why not take a little bite at a time say uh, go with uh, putting uh, rate 9 in here just go ahead and do that part first and just do one bite at a time and then reassess after it's done what needs to go happen next. Don't, don't do it all at once. I agree it needs to be done and I'm sure everybody in town agrees, but just do a little bite at a time. To, uh, yeah. Again, let me take a stab at that. It's a structural change we're proposing here. That's why my preference, as long as, our, as we can accommodate it within our current tax rate, is to do as much as we can so we can do the whole structure 
as well as we can quickly. The interest rates today are at historic lows. I don't know what they're going to be if we if we um, track this out over a 20-year period. Do one grade school this five years, another grade school. Bear in mind, you're going to be paying all the operating costs, all the maintenance costs, and all the other stuff on those current buildings. But it's the interest rates that are the big deal right now from my perspective. And if those go up, which I believe they will, that could you know, you may get one addition of one building done and the rest of it's going to just play fallow. That's my opinion. But, but that, that's how I've, um, that's how I've come to peace with this because originally I was with you as Stephanie could tell, uh, could tell you. But I believe right now with the interest rates as they are locking in construction prices where they are, we can do this now. And we may need, you know, these extra schools if Barack Obama and Quinn have their way and import all these illegal aliens in here. You take a few out in your neighborhood. Well, and the other thing is we have, we, I mean, we have discussed doing ninth grade and one elementary just to test the waters. But then we are subject to the election cycle. So, I mean, we have to go back to the taxpayers every time for you to say yes and yes and yes. What about if that yes doesn't happen in a piecemeal? And we build out at Monroe, and everyone's happy with that one grade school. That's all we need. Those kids get to go there. Everything else stops. Is that fair to the rest of the district? I mean, because, again, we have to wait the costs go up, the construction costs go up, we have to shuffle the kids, where are they going to go, some are here for a year, I mean, those logistics, the public really doesn't understand, and, and we need to inform them about that, but but we have talked about the piecemeal, and, and it just, cost-wise, time-wise, it's just, it, it, it's not an economical thing to but do. But you do realize we're losing a large employer here in town. And now we're going to probably be losing a lot of workers that are going to leave this area. What's going to happen there? Well, you know? and then I have teachers at Ellington or other grade schools that are telling me, Stephanie, I've got 27, 28 kindergartners over at Ellington that can't fit in that classroom. Or how is it when a parent or a family comes in to our district and they go into a classroom and the window air is running so loud that they can't teach above it. I mean, our buildings are simply too old. And, you know, yes, but if you visit the schools and you see the number of kids that we're putting into classrooms, into these old buildings, you'll understand why the need is to do this for all the students to benefit and not just do one at a time. But do you want to become a Chicago? We won't. My daughter lives up in Chicago, and she says the schools up there are great. They're building new schools all the time. She can't afford to live there, but right. I mean, that's, Mark, that's Mark, what's going on. I would like to say something. Go ahead. Mark, I was 100% on your side when we started this project. That was my ideal concept of how we should do this. And I agree with what these guys have said. There's basically three points of what convinced me not to stay on that. Well, I'm in the construction business. I'm looking at construction costs going up already due to inflation. I only see that increasing as interest rates start to climb, which is the other factor. If we have to borrow money, which we do to do these projects, we're going to pay higher interest. We're going to pay higher construction costs. But then you can also consider the logistics of moving these kids around. If we build one new school building, we keep the other six Okay, which kids are going to go where? What grade structure are going to be in the other six? Are we going to keep a K-3? Are we going to convert to K-5 in those? If we build another building, how are we going to shuffle the kids around to do that? It really becomes a logistic nightmare. And once you start building a new building, I guarantee you every parent in Quincy is going to want to figure out how to get their kid in that district. I mean, you see it all the time up in Chicago, you know, as they build a new school, they move into that area. And yes, it's advantageous to have new schools here in Quincy. It would probably help the uh, businesses around here to bring in more and better help. But, I mean, to get everybody 
I mean, you look at wages right now. How many people since 2008 have been getting these great wage increases? How many? Anybody want to raise their hand? But again, may I ask you, would you spend $67 million plus interest to maintain what we have or spend the $89 million to get all new? Well, I mean, it makes Within more sense. Within the current tax rate. Within the current tax rate. Your tax would not go up unless your EAV went up. So you can choose. That's right. what we're going to... If you we vote decide. yes, you get to choose whether to spend $65 million on existing... To maintain. maintain. Or $89. I, I think 81 to 89 because frankly there's contingencies built in that for site and everything else. But you have the ability, only if we vote yes, do you have the ability to choose the change. If we vote, if a no vote prevails, you don't get a vote on the 67 million. You don't get a no vote, you don't get to vote on the 67 million. So what we're doing is giving you the opportunity to choose between those two things and it's within the same tax rate. And if our current tax rate is too high, it's lower than it was when I got elected. So keep that in mind too. Well, I mean, it makes sense to... Uh, it's your choice. If you'd rather have problem. new, if you're having basically car problems, you're, you're right. gonna... How many times do you repair the car before you decide it's to time to get new, or how right. you know how big does your family get to where you start looking that you need a more efficient house to accommodate your family? But in that same boat. It, even so, if you're broke, you don't buy a new car. Right. I mean, plain and simple. Right. But I mean, there there is a little common sense to it too. Well, I want to comment on that point right there. This board has been very fiscally responsible. Well, I know this is the best board we've had in 20 years. And, I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> the reason we're even looking at this is if we didn't take out any new debt, we will almost be debt free in 2017. So that's the only reason we're even considering this is because we have been responsible. But, but the way I do things is I save up money and then I buy stuff. But we can't do that. That's against the state law. We can't save up the money and then spend it. We have to borrow it to spend it. We're not attacking. We're just passionate. <laughs> I believe you. Oh. <laughs> I agree with you, Mark. I'd love to save up the money and do it, but we can't. Well, I, I'd just like to see a little more, a little at a time. I think it's just going to be hard for everybody to swallow. It is. It's a lot of money. Yeah. Is thirty million too much? Because that's a high school and one grade school. Exactly. I, I think, you that, think would, that would be better. I think that would be better. Then, well, then it all at one time. Well, if this doesn't pass, some future board may choose to do, go that way. But I don't know what their tax rates will be, and I can't tell you what that interest rate will be either. And I can't tell you that the public will vote yes for the rest of the project. Yeah. <laughs> we're giving you the vision, and we're giving you <laughs> So, But thank you very That's much. Yeah. Thank I think you. you guys are doing a good job. Well, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. I have yes, a question. Yes, I want to speak as loud as I can. And I don't feel well, so if you ask me a question, I'm not going to be able to help you. But I've been going to the finance committee meetings, and I noticed our educational fund is about $2.5 million in the red. And supposedly in another year, it's going to be $5 million in the red. And maybe a couple more years, it's going to be $9 million in the red. And how are we going to, the next thing's going to happen, is we're going to have to get another general obligation bond like we did on the 6.2 million. And if we don't pass that, number one, we have to close schools like we did Lincoln School, and we closed a very end school, we did over again. We closed Franklin School, we closed Webster School, we closed the Jefferson School, Jackson School, Highland School. If we cut down our costs, and what happens if you have a $9 million deficit in three or four years and you do a general obligation bond like we did before with the two six point two million uh, and what if it doesn't pass then you have to lay off teachers and close schools and I think you need to think of the other side because I'm seeing that maybe we have eighty four million dollars that you can borrow against 
And if you're going to borrow $89 million and with $9 million of rent, how are you going to get the taxpayers to do another job obligation bond of $9 million? This is, I think, something that you need to think about before you make a vote tonight. Well, so the other I can't part that hear the question uh, because my hearing. I am going to get a full letter, letter here. That's so fine. I'll be able to do better in the future. Sure. But That's fine. But the other part I don't think, and Joel may want to, or Todd, that the overhead costs, I mean, as far as you have to think, we have seven elementaries now and three principals at Baldwin. So we're 10 administrators in those buildings. If we cut down to five, I mean, we haven't made any decisions, but the overhead costs and the efficiency of the new buildings alone will roughly save us $2 million a year to help with those ed fund expenses that are, you know, causing us to go in the red. So is that accurate, Joel? Yes, that is that is accurate. And, and um, Gus, just to, to, the overall education fund is not in the red. Uh, I want to make sure you, we're, we're clear on that. We have three different sub-funds within the education fund. Um, and one of them, yes, is, is, is running in, in the red, and it's been running in the red. Um, and, and we, pro through this year, we'll be looking to make some transfers within the fund to bring that out of being in the red. Um, it's a, been a process that happened for a number of years. It's based on a, a, an accounting issue and, and not a fact that we don't have the cash in the bank to cover that, that those dollars. So um, we are working on that. But you're also then talking two different issues, though, too. In, in the bond it is to build structures and, and to build things those dollars cannot be used for operating cost. Um, I can't hire teachers out of that $84 million. Um, and even the, the $6.2 million working cash fund that was sold, $2 million was transferred to the education fund to bring it into the black. And then the, the whole education fund, not just the, the different sub funds. And the rest has remained in the bank as an internal bank for the district to borrow against. If um, we've, we've worked very hard to live within our means and not have to borrow against that that internal bank. And we've done that for the last two years. We've not had to go back and, and borrow for a cash flow basis or borrow to cover. And that's what that bank is there for, is to, is, is to borrow against. And we just have to keep our close eye on our, our cost and look at we, what we can do or can't do and live within the means that, that, that we have uh, based upon are the general taxes that, that supply the education fund, the, the, the state aid and, and, and other state grants that we get, and our federal grants that we get. So um, uh, you know, whether we, we shouldn't be needing to borrow working cash, you know, the, the nine million, as you say, down the road, um, if we do our job and, and keep within what we're doing. I just want to clarify what you just said. A couple of years ago when we passed the working cash bond, we transferred 2.2 million from that working cash into education to bring it into the black. Since then, we've been operating on a balanced budget. Yes. So there is no red and we're not losing money every year. And that was the basis on which the working cash bond was put to the voter. That that money would, the, 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 that we would get our education fund out of the red and we would bank the balance for a rainy day. And that's exactly what we've done. And we haven't spent it either. We haven't and touched it. That, in turn, got us off the financial watch list. Because when I came on this board, our financial outlook was very dire and grim. We were put on the financial watch list for the first time we had to do a balanced budget, forecasted out for three years, which you know, prior business managers had not looked ahead to see what we were doing. Um, our bond rating was worse than junk lines. bonds. I mean, terrible. So when we passed that working cash bond, so many financial things helped us to get us where we are now. And we have, we have not had an ed fund rate increase. We're still at one of the lowest in the state, if not the lowest, as far as our ed fund rate. We have not raised the, we've kept that tax rate steady. I think we've been financially fiscal. I mean, we had, when Bud Martin was our business manager, he sat me down, 
before he left when I was finance chair and said, Stephanie, you have this golden opportunity to build new buildings and improve the public school sector because of the way we've handled debt. And in addition, our borrowing power at 84 million plus we have a, even though we were going through that financial watch list, we were, you know, our, our bond ratings were terrible, our borrowing power was very strong. And that was because we did not borrow ourselves to pay teachers. We did not borrow ourselves to make sure we kept the programs that we needed. We did make the tough decisions and we cut one plus million, blah, blah, blah. So, I mean, we, I think, you know, to get to this point, we've proven ourselves that I hope we know what we're talking about. Anything else? Okay. So I have a question. Sure. Todd. Yes. <clears throat> I read in the paper that uh, any new school being built from here on has to have like a storm cellar or whatever you want to call it. Yes. So where does that figure in on this 89 million? We've got that accounted for, bud. And that's in the new schools, the new K-5 schools, uh, we're putting the gymnasium will be that storm shelter. I thought it had to be underground. No, it's just a structure that, be, that has to be able to withstand a tornadic uh, wind of 350 mile per hour. And we've got that accounted for, and it does add money to the cost, but that's, that's included. Okay, I was just wondering about yep, that. Yep, that's a good question. Any other questions from the board? Comments? Something, something that keeps coming up again and again. It keeps it bothers me a bit. Uh, when I was going to school, I mean, my parents moved to Washington, so I district, so I could go to Washington. But I didn't worry about what the other schools were like. I did find it curious that people that lived in Spring Lake went to Ellington and go to Washington. But I didn't spend a whole lot of my time worrying about it. I felt the teachers there, Dr. Rob's a principal, and all the teachers there were doing the best that they could, and I learned as much as I could. It wasn't perfect. It was a great way to start. I think they could have had a better library, but, but it just made me absorb literature when I went to junior high because I didn't really have the opportunities at the elementary level. But this thing is we've got to have everything exactly alike. For all this, they have to have the same experience throughout QPS 172. I'm sorry. That scares me. That sounds a lot like... Orwell, that's Orwellian to me. It's like when I read from Mrs. Smiley and Miss Smiley's class in seventh grade about you know Animal Farm. All are created equal, and then they have the line later at the end. Sorry, ruin it for you. Okay. So, so but, I mean, it bothered, but it's like the idea that everything has to be exactly the same for everybody. And and there's yeah, you get if you get a new school, you if you phase them in, okay, you're going to have probably it's going to be a bigger school, but then at Washington it's going to be a smaller school. So there'll be trade-offs between the different schools. I don't think we I think we get overly focused on everybody having exactly the same experience. Even if you take the city, you divide it north to south and east west and put it into quadrants or quints or whatever for five, you're st I mean you're still not going to have the exact same experience. And to me, it's kind of creepy to try to say that you can do that. And I, I, it just, I've been hearing that a lot, and it's like it's not something that we worried about when we went to school. It was just, and I don't think the, the teachers or parents just to give the best possible education, whether you're in Spring Lake and you go to Ellington, or you're on Spruce Street and you go and you go to Washington. We didn't really spend a whole lot of time worrying about am I getting the exact same experience they got at Monroe, or you know, we just didn't spend time on that. It just it bothers me that we seem to be overly focused on. Well, like you said, and George said it too. If I've learned anything at all, Jeff, we can, we will not please everyone. I mean, this is the plan that the steering committee, the architects, to even get this far and have this type of presentation to even put it on the ballot is a historical thing that we haven't done. I mean, not everyone's going to like the carpet we pick. Not everyone's going to like where the band are. I mean, it's endless. It's it's the right. big And not everybody on the steering committee agrees. Exactly. And you are on that. So, 
I think um, we need to move on. I'm just going to kind of summarize, unless um, the board will still be able to make a comment before they vote, but unless there's any other questions. Well, I just wanted to finish because something was brought up that's on the last page about the well, working cash bond. Jeff, it, that's it, off the working cash. I mean, well, I'm sorry. We, really didn't, we didn't get this. What was Mr. Martin promised? We didn't get the $6 million. We got five. Well, million. you go over that every time. Working right. cash is, is a whole, to, you know, but we've been diligent with that, okay? It's not been spent. That little and, bit and again. Jeff, you and I raised that issue in that election, and we did not prevail. So right. drop it. Right. Okay. But it's I, done. I, it was it's brought done. up again, but I just wanted to make sure that's why I brought it up. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Okay, so what I'm going to do is, in layman terms, basically summarize. Todd, help me if I'm leaving anything out. Okay, as far as Steve read the legal, uh, what the ballot will say. But we are basically proposing elementary K through fives, three that will be put on completely new land, which we need to acquire. But that cost of what we think is already built into the 89 million, um, we will use our existing site at Monroe and tear that building down and build a new elementary at that site. And now after going through phase two and people asking us, while well, you've changed the recommendation from four to five, we saw that the cost and efficiency, the size of the schools needs to go, and we need to use the Baldwin land, and we already have those existing you know, areas that we don't have to build. So we would tear down Baldwin, except those existing areas, and build a new elementary there. We would move sixth grade to junior high for that to be sixth, seventh, and eighth. Um, and then here at the high school, as you propose moving the freshmen to here to have a 9 through 12 campus and adding on, but also redoing this existing facility in various areas to update what needs to be done. That's right. And in the 89 million uh, is a contingency that we have built in. Um, we realize that when we go to the public and ask for 89 million, if it does pass, we have to stay within that 89 million. We will not go back for more. And as far as the best estimate today, when we vote on this, it should cover furniture and fixtures, technology, playground equipment, like you said. Everything is covered in there. Yes. Okay. So, next. Well, I'd like to go ahead and make a motion. If, if a site, has he joined us yet? Yeah. 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 I will. It's just, yeah, oh, no, I wondered if Saeed was on the roll. Oh, just, just for clarification for the audience, Saeed is away on work, and he's asked to be brought in when we're ready to make the motion and vote on this. As we wait for him then to, to join us, we'll give him just a couple of minutes here. I, I would like just to say that you know, this process has is, is really been a, a really good process. It's been somewhat logical in how it, how it started. If you, if you remember over a year ago, uh, we knew we were getting to the point here that we had uh, these bonds that were coming due and that we were going to, you know, we have the option of doing the life safety bonds, which is when the state comes in and says this is what you have to do. Uh, those, are, those are bonds that we'll have to have, and there's no reason to believe they'll be less than what they've been. So the, uh, so the question was asked, um, if we have to spend the money, should we spend it on new buildings? And we just started in that process. No one really had the answer at that point. Should it be new or should we just stay with the ones that we had? And we did the logical next step was take a look at the buildings that we have and, uh, and evaluate those. And the conclusion was that the schools that were in the worst shape uh, were really the elementary schools. Uh, and those are the ones that we're looking at, at providing new schools uh, now based on, on this proposal. Uh, there's been a lot of community uh, support, or I should say community input. Uh, there's been uh, uh, business uh, community input. Uh, uh, there's, there's just been there's a lot of back and forth here. So I think it's a good balance. I think it's a good balance of working within our budget needs. I think it's a good balance of working within the needs that we have in our facilities. And, and I think it's a good balance for the community in, in general uh, as uh, to, to bring some pride back into this community, to bring some, uh, some life back here. So emplo employers are looking to bring uh, people into the community. They look at it and they say, uh, I can see you're committed to education uh, just by your buildings. Uh, and so there's many, many reasons uh, to, uh, to, to vote for this or, and to get it on the ballot. So with that, I, my recommendation 
We have to go to legal before a motion's made. Okay. Okay. Ready for me? Yes. Ready for me? Okay. Sorry. Uh, first of all, I want to explain to everybody as you have probably been through this before. Uh, here we have we have Chapman and Colors on Bond Council, and they have very specific directions on what we are to do at this meeting, and it is my responsibility to see that we comply, and so that's that's where we are. So the very first thing is I would note for the record, I believe we had Saeed Ali is not on the phone telephonically. He is uh, out of uh, the city on business. Uh, and is there any objection to his participation telephonically? No, no. Seeing no objection, uh, the, we'll proceed with the, with the process as outlined by bond council. The president announced that the Board of Education would next consider the adoption of a resolution providing for and requiring the submission of the proposition of issuing school building bonds to the voters of the district in the general election to be held on November the 4th, 2014. Madam President, do you so announce? Yes, I do. Whereupon we need somebody to present. Member Mays. Whereupon Member Mays presented and the Secretary read by title. Resolution providing for and requiring the submission of the proposition of issuing school building bonds to the voters of School District Number 172, Adams County, Illinois, at the general election to be held on the fourth day of November, 2014. A copy of which was provided to each of the members of the Board of Education prior to the meeting and to everyone in attendance who desired one. There's still a stack up here on the table. It's now time, uh, Sheldon. I think I'll make the proposal that, that we uh, that we add this uh, to the uh, to the. Uh, oh, we didn't have a resolution. Yeah, I want to have a motion to adopt this resolution to put on the ballot for November as it reads. I have a second. I'll second it. Thank you, Scott. And I think if there's any further discussion or comment from the board members before they vote, now would be the time for that. Okay. So, Scott, anything? Or Richard, would you like to? I will comment at my time of vote. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else want to comment? Comment when you vote or do you want to comment now? Oh, I've already said everything I want to say. <laughs> Okay, if they would like to comment when they vote, um, we will start the roll call. Phyllis? Member McNay? Uh, thank you. Uh, I would just like to uh, make a few comments before I vote um, and explain my vote. I would uh, first like to thank Joel and the architect firms and the uh, facility committee for the hundreds if not thousands of hours they put in to uh, put this project before us uh, in the short amount of time that uh, you were given. If you remember anything I say tonight, I hope this is what you will remember. I support grade reconfiguration and building new schools. There are two methods to fund building programs, and both require a referendum. The first method is using property tax within District 172 to pay for the program. The second method is using a countywide sales tax. When I compare the two taxes, I find that the sales tax has many advantages versus the property tax method. First, it relies on sales tax, not property tax, to finance the building program. Also, 31% of the revenue generated by a sales tax comes from consumers which live outside of Adams County. So, i.e., you are receiving a 38% subsidy for the program. Third, the other four districts in Adams County would also share in the sales tax revenue if it was voted upon and approved. District 172 would receive approximately 70% of revenue or approximately $5 million per year to be used only for brick mortar remodel buildings. The other 30% would be divided among the other four districts in Adams County based on their populate their student population. With sales tax, 
you have the option to build as you accumulate the revenue. It would be a slower building process, but you would not necessarily have to borrow money. Using sales tax, it would take longer, but we could bring the project in at a much lower cost because we're not incurring $60 million in financing the bonds. I close by reiterating, I support grade reconfiguration and I support the building program by using sales tax, not property tax. So therefore, Madam Secretary, I vote no. Member Nikan? No. Ali? Aye. Bailey? Aye. Stone? I want to make a few comments here. Um, first, I want to talk about the plan, as a lot of people have talked here. Um, I guess my first question when I looked at this plan, is this the perfect plan? And I make this comment to every customer I ever deal with when I start a new construction project. I tell them, you're not perfect, I'm not perfect. There was only one person that was perfect that walked on this earth. So this isn't the perfect plan. And I don't build perfect houses. Is this the best plan? In my mind, in Richard's mind, in Bud's mind, we all have different ideas about what the best plan is. And I think the committee who put together this plan looked at all the requirements and came up with the best solution that met all those requirements. So, I think it was a very good plan, and I, I can support that plan. We've talked about it already tax rate. This bond referendum can be structured so that we do not have to raise the tax rate. Now, to make Richard Lee's point about uh, the sales tax, this does not prevent us from discussing the sales tax in the future. And we've discussed that before also. I think it is a separate issue and it needs to be discussed. But right now, the issue before us is this bond referendum and this bond can be structured and, and paid off without increasing the tax rate. Also, what we discussed earlier tonight is this is not a choice between an 80 to 90 million dollar project and spending zero. This is a choice between spending 81 to 89 million for new buildings or spending $66 million over the next 20 years on our existing buildings and in 20 years have buildings that are 20 years older. I think it makes financial sense. I think it's, it's something we have been planning on doing, so I vote yes. Member Mays? A couple comments and um, as if you recall in the working cash bond thing, I said I made a comment at the board meeting after we had put the working cash bond issue on the ballot. That was the meeting I had stated at the meeting that we put it on, and I was told and sanctioned and got a letter of reprimand uh, as a board member for taking a position that was very public and simply stating it again. So I guess this is my only opportunity safely to talk about the, all the reasons why I, I think this is a good idea. And now you can say you yeah. really do support the working cash flow. I think Jeff was dead on. It was 400000 extra, but that's another sip. <laughs> but, but no, um, uh, I, and, and I generally think the, the staff and the community participated in all forms. I mean, all the maintenance janitors that took us, I mean, this board has been out to every school this year in meetings. We did, you know, we didn't hold them in the round room and hold them in our meetings. We actually went to our board meetings at every school we got. We had facility tours that were open to the public where 
and the architects talked about that building, what its, what its, what its capacities were, what its limitations were. I mean, it was an hour over a 12-month period. This has been a drumbeat that, 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 that has been steady. And so my, my hats off to, the, to everybody uh, from the public and certainly the, uh, the staff that, that, that helped us do that and give us a better understanding of, of what we are as a district. And Richard, I really appreciate your point about you are for the buildings, you are for structural change. And that's the headline here. The method is what you have an issue with, and I, I appreciate that. You're, you've been very consistent that way. Now, let me just get into my brief remarks. What do you mean deliver as a board? I know that might show some people because you often have to have somebody to throw something at. But let me just point out, we maintain our facilities very, very well in this district. We're the best 124 building school building in the state that's in active use right now. We also have two of the best 100-year-old buildings in the state, and a couple of the best 100-year-old buildings, and three of the best 50 year old buildings that have been designed for years and have been extended. Now, that is a tribute not to this but to all the buildings that have come before us. So, we can maintain the buildings. We can do that. We can continue to do that. It's going to cost 65 million dollars a night, but we can do it, and we can do it well. We have the EPA paying us for a sewer, a sanitary sewer system issue. We don't have a deferred maintenance issue on a swimming pool that that we can take care of. We don't have a a, um, a general fund safe because it's been neglected by the taxpayers' investments. We've taken care of our schools, but we can continue to do that. All right? That's the first point. Second, we can live within our means. And it's not going to happen with this board, with, with the previous boards, and Tom's here, uh, 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 Bill uh, Daniels, Glenn Bemis, Kurt Wallace. You know, we started turning the district around and, and, and taking a good look at what we've done. Um, and, and we're kind of the beneficiary of that, that kind of work. It wasn't that long ago that the tax rate was $4.15 per hundred. It's four dollars and thirteen cents this year only because the voters over objections voted to uh, issue a working cash bond. And that bumped us up from 405 or 406 to 413. That's why where it is. It's because the voters said to do it. Otherwise, we would be at 405. Over the past four years, even as we've held our rates steady, the state has cut $500 million. Have you heard us cry about it? You know, this board wants to encourage people to not say about that darn state, if only we do this, or that darn Obama and federal government keep getting out of our lunchrooms. We don't cry like that. We just do our business. We put up our sleeves and we made it meet. And at the same time, we retired $29 million in debt. And in three years, we're going to be debt free. And that's why you as a voter get a chance to, vote, to, to help us decide to do or maintain. We've created that capacity, all of us. And you can guide it now. Only if we vote yes. But we've created capacity, and it has, my hands off to uh, uh, the board members and the staff that have made the tough decisions, lived with the with, with a budget that some, sometimes I didn't want to live with. That's my second point. We can deliver. We can live within our means. We've demonstrated that. We can build better schools. The process that we went through to put those up there, who would not want those? I was thinking about being a Galatarian. What parent wouldn't want their kids in that school? And what was 
and say, I don't want them to get it. This school district gets it. This school gets it. This one. And if we did a sales tax, it'd be three years before they had to do one, before they could even show, uh, 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 put, a, put a shovel in the dirt. So, what we can build better schools. But good schools, better schools, are not even just bricks and mortar, and we can do that. This board knows that. The previous board has known that. But especially this board. Look what we've done to change what's happening inside the schools. Look at, I mean, there's a lot of new things. We, we started with the excuses. We started with the performance. We started with high and clear academic standards. We started with the curriculum. We have done a tremendous job trying to be as public as possible on math and English language arts curriculum that's a lot of them down. The assessments that are coming in, not just the park, but the, but the math assessment, which gives us student growth, October, February, and end of year. And we can, make, we can make decisions based on those tests and on those standards. And we haven't shut away from making those decisions. We create higher expectations for student performance. We have, if you'll recall, set a school for students who fall behind. And we still have the teachers, the principals, and the staff that have made those tough decisions, and have to find the even tougher discussions with the parents and kids, telling them what the consequence is for not keeping up. This means that we don't have to issue any bonds to do, but these are things that this board has embraced, our staff has embraced. We set a trajectory that I think is tremendous, whether this passes or not. But I think it's happening. This, we need buildings that can equal where we want to take and our staff want to take our kids. Just doing it won't work. Just doing it won't work. We need them both. But if we can do what we've done on the inside, I'm not really for this right now. And we have to do that on the inside with what we really do. But we have to do it together. Finally, we can allow you to choose, but only by voting yes for this. We've created the capacity, I don't know the right way to record, we've created the will. The, the, the now, give us the guidance to do that. I've got to vote yes. If you have a vote now, you can make a choice. A future board is going to be told by the state you've got to issue 60 plus million in bonds to take care of the old bonds that you've got. So, I'm going to vote yes for this. I strongly support it. I, I, I love what this board has done. I, I, you know, we've built upon, I think we've kept the faith with the past boards, and we've created the capacity to give you a fair choice. You don't like it. You vote now, we can go the other way. We've done a great job doing it, but Madison School will then be 144 years old when we have the next opportunity. So I would, I would request that uh, I, I strongly support this. Uh, I, 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 I will be as fair an advocate for this as I can possibly be when I come and speak to your groups. And um, I'm going to vote yes now because I've said my piece. Thank you. Erwin. OK. Um, thank you to everybody. Um, it has been a fun and uh, tedious process and, and uh, anyone who knows knows that I have had a passion for these buildings for really ever since I was elected to the board, especially getting the ninth graders um, to the senior high. Uh, I have, and I, Sheldon does, we, I think we're the board, only board members that currently have kids in QPS. I still have one, huh? 
Oh, you do? Early childhood. Oh, oh, early childhood, sorry. But, um, you know, I do see every day uh, uh, the elementary and, and what those teachers are having to deal with on a daily basis and doing a great job at what they do. And like we said, buildings don't make the education, but they certainly help deliver the education in an environment that we want to deliver it in a more uh, efficient and an environment that benefits both the staff and the teachers. I look at this as it's not just a QPS thing. When we put this on the rep referendum, um, it is a whole community thing. It, it, it benefits this entire community, and as mayor, former mayor Chuck Schultz said, I mean, we are lucky as a town of a town this size to be able to have two great choices, parochial and, and public. And we know uh, Q&D uses QHS for classes that they can't provide, and I think bridging that relationship would will hopefully enhance with uh, expanded and newer buildings. And um, so, so it is, it, it's a whole community uh, process. And that's why you get to decide whether or not we ultimately get to do this. And that's what I think is so great. I mean, we have been through this, you know our passion for it, and, and, and ultimately it, it is most likely, from what I hear, to go on the ballot. But you will make the decision, and, and we will have to prove our case to you as to why. Um, and, and the subcommittee of George's will, uh, you know, have to educate you over the next three months. Is it going to be easy? No. Is 89 million a big pill to swallow? Yes, it is. But it's needed. It's a, it, it, it is the perfect time. We have been fiscally responsible. I think this, I think all the board members, um, we've had robust discussion. We don't always agree, but we do come to understand each other and why they may not agree or disagree with, with what your own personal decision is. So anyway, um, to shut down and not keep babbling, uh, I'm just happy to be at this point, at this historical point. Something like this, a facelift of this nature, I don't think um, even getting it to the ballot has ever been done in the history of the, the school district. And so um, just turning it over to the voters is, is to me just a big feat in itself and a first step in a, in a big journey. So um, I'm supporting it, I'm voting yes, and uh, would like to see it on the November ballot. Thank you. I think you may declare, Madam President, that the proposition passes. It did, five to two. Five to two. Thank you. Okay. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Madam President, before you move on, uh, just for the community and members of the media, we have prepared a uh, building referendum fact sheet that includes background information, general information, construction costs, and also financial bond and tax impact that will be available for anyone at the conclusion of the meeting that would like it. corrected that one too. On the second page you'll notice that the, just so you know, we do want you to get out and vote. <laughs> November 4th, not November 5th. Mr. Murphy. It'll go out on Wednesday. Okay. Anything else? We move to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. Scott, second. Jeff, adjourn. Who was it? Sorry.